me to start? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your interest, of course. First of all, great to have you. Uh, as I always struggle to, to say very concrete stuff about the singular works, I start with two preludes, kind of tuning you in general things about the consciousness, um, how we should conceive any art or even our own existence first. So I make a little journey with you. Imagine it would be possible to put you in a rocket spaceship. You will have a, quite a confined space around you, but you have a window. Okay, now imagine you are, you have been away for 50, 100 years. It would be all possible. Yes, there's a film about that just recently. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 90 years ago. They picked... <laughs> <laughs> so you imagine being out there and then suddenly that you would see something floating by, like, like this banal object, so-called so -called banal object. Comes, comes here in front of the window and then vanishes again. What kind of feeling would you have if you had been away from your human context, from the earth, longing to it, just have memories? And then suddenly, this object, which is an everyday object, floats by. It would be filled so much with everything which is, uh, make, makes out humanity as such. It would be quite, quite a, a metaphor, a symbol for everything you left behind. A very impacted thing. And that is one of the premises, I think, to encounter art, and not just that, but every day. Because nothing is ordinary, nothing. Because it is a miracle to be and to have a consciousness about things that they are, they exist. So every, everything deserves to be um, watched and attended and have, you know, we, we should be consciously, consciously looking at things as a unique entity in space on the same level as we are ourselves. There's no hierarchy. Something is more valuable less valuable. No, I think everything has its, its wonderful place in this big um, framework where we are embedded in. This was Prelude 1. Prelude 2. <clears throat> if we are born, there is a point after a while, after the we develop in our consciousness that suddenly we realize what I am. This uh, split or cut in existence, let's call it that way, is like a cut between the object world, the world out there, and the subject world, me. I can say me. By saying me, I catapult myself out of, of, of being united. Because actually everything is one and united. But consciousness is like a, a catapult, throwing ourselves out and alienate us from the object world. Now, what happens? If that, if that alienation takes place, 
we are desperately trying to be one again. How do we do that? By language. If we attach labels to a cloud, we say, we see something there, and then we say, cloud. We see uh, something green with a, with a stem, we say, tree, or whatever. We, we, categorize, we categorize everything we, that we, we, which comes into our awareness. So we label things in order to be able, with closed eyes, to regain what we have lost. Now I can think of a cloud, of a tree, of whatever. So virtu virtually, I regain what I have lost, so I try to unify myself virtually with everything. So, art is a similar process. It, it, it creates a bridge between the subject and the object world. So it leads us back to what we have lost. So this is basically my starting point, that this miracle of awareness, this, this, this miracle, I am. And that is the, 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 the motor, so to say, of everything I do in art, to try to convey that feeling of uniqueness, of being in a bigger framework and to recognize ourselves. It's like, it should be like a mirror. We should find ourselves somewhere. I mean, not just in every art. Art should be a mirror where the observer can find him or herself and relate to the bigger one. It's like a, a peep through to something much bigger. It's just a little window which opens to that. So that is my general starting point. Now, it will be a bit uh, another task to talk about the works itself, because uh, the works even though they have sometimes topics, specific topics, should be open systems. So for every one of you, it should mean something, could mean, should mean something else. So I don't want to fixate what I, th I put in there and limit you from having other thoughts. Um, when I work, it's, as you can see, in the, specifically here in this exhibition mainly, that uh, I pay much attention to details, which means it takes me ages to finish something, and the process is very important. Because the process is like meditation for me. It takes hours and hours and days doing the same thing. And, of course, during that process of being, being there and not there at the same time, being me and being somewhere else, there is a lot of things flowing into that. At the end, it's like waking up of a dream, out of a dream, and then trying to analyze what I have dreamt, and then getting a title eventually. But it's seldom preconceived. Sometimes it's just a a flash of a thought like, like that work there, I see, you know? Suddenly, I, I see, ah, oh, I see. And then it's like a, it's an, an ironic approach to, to, the, to the language itself. You know, you have these double, double layers, of course. I don't have to explain that probably more. Um, and then I, I find means to realize that, to, to manifest, to materialize that thought. So that is preconceived, of course. It didn't come out just like that. I had to, to, to work on it, to structure it. But with many other things, for example, those works which, have, which are dotted, it starts somewhere, and then it just goes on. And, and 
the outcome is unpredictable. And unpredictability, I think, is a very strong element in aesthetics. If you, if you, if you just let yourself be guided by, by forces which are bigger than yourself, then you, you, you feel that you are almost part of, of, a, of a natural process. And that, of course, happens very often in my work, too. Other than, for example, this work here, which is, um, <clears throat> as some of you know already, it's a, it's, it's a braille text. So, of course, this had to be translated. The text is uh, the uh, Declaration of Human Rights in, in braille. Braille positions, I must say, because braille, of course, is much smaller, you know. Uh, but just the positions, the letters, are positions of prayer. And, um, well, from, to this particular work, I can say something definitely, uh, which, is, which uh, through, went through my mind when I did it and planned it. These are jasmines, and, and the jasmine is uh, a symbol, or was a symbol, during the, the uprising in Egypt and in Tunisia and in China. Uh, the, in China, they even forbid the, the, the jasmine to, to sell on the markets because it was a symbol for uprising. So they were not allowed to, to sell it. And it's called Jasmine Connects. Jasmine Connects, so all this, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the forces of uprising uh, connected with, with the uh, text of the Declaration of Human Rights, which is, looks pretty in the beginning, maybe, and I think, oh, it's very decorative, but it should have another, it has another underlying meaning. Um, but it's not often that my work has such a clear meaning, like, uh, like this one. This one, for example, and that one, they play with, with surfaces, with illusions, with, what shall I say, it's like, a, that, that's, that's a, a surface of water, you know, the, to catch that very moment, you know, of, of all these movements, that instant is frozen there. And both works could be uh, works that lead to, to meditation, you know, they should have that calm, calmness in themselves and, and uh, bring you somewhere different, out of the everyday life. Um, these works here are based on photographic um, base, uh, uh, impression, it's, it's grass. Actually there's a second work which I have not here, didn't even tell you for It's a horse, actually, <laughs> and the horse is not far from where we live in, in New Zealand. It's a, it's a very sad horse, a white horse. It's covered with a, with a coat, with a plate, always looking at me when I go by, standing there like the, the, the creature, the creature, just a creature. It could be a horse, it, just a symbol for a creature, but standing there. And that horse, what is he doing the whole day? Eating grass. So that's his perspective, you know, of the, that's why it's called grass meditation. And I tried to be a horse for a while, because I was, you know, I did it all by hand, uh, this, the ink, the ink, uh, uh, no, uh, lining. Line, well, line, yeah, lining. So I, I tried to, to be, how is, how is it to be a horse? Did you try and eat some grass? Uh, yeah, I, I have many, of, many times I have a piece of grass in my mouth anyway. So, and, and, that one, and that one is uh, also based on a natural impression near us on the beach. There are sometimes periods where you have this red, al pink, pink algae washing on the shore, and it looks like a Japanese uh, watercolor drawing or, or, or Chinese watercolor drawing. So I was, I was um, somehow guided by that and, and inspired by that. So that is that motive. But it's also, as you can see, uh, dotted. Mm. 
And well, this one speaks by itself. It's for forces of physical forces, which created movements. I mean, of course, I help, but it's gravitational forms which dry, and then I mark it. Sometimes I mark, I mark uh, just the unimportant. If I, if I go into it, I mark it, and suddenly it becomes important. As I, I said initially, you know, when nothing, is, nothing is ordinary. So you can take anything and then contemplate. So what is it? Is it a liquid cement? Or? Oh, it, has, it is a mixed media. It is, it is cement, it has oxides, and of course it has, it has this orange uh, pigments in it, yeah. yeah. And then the dots. You may ask yourself, <laughs> dots. Uh, obviously, I have I missed him. It was an Aboriginal man here at, at the opening. Who was, he was wondering why the hell is he doing dots? He, you know, what's ours to do, not me. Uh, quick explanation to that. Um, I come from a totally different angle. I think I had I had this theory, or still have it in a way. Why do the Aboriginals, uh, the particular uh, ethnia who, who works with dots, do dots. And I think, and because you're exposed to light here in Australia very strongly. And if you close your eyes after being exposed, what I see in, in any case, I see all little dots floating. And since the Aboriginal have, have, Aborigines have this uh, mythology or, or belief that through dreams, through dream path, they are connected with their ancestry. Maybe someday one of them saw those dots as close as says, ah, if I, I now I am in the dream world and if I manifest that dream world, I, I do dots and maybe, maybe that is a, a, a materialization of that and that's how it evolved, but it's a very far-fetched theory. Of course, it just uh, I just put it in the in, into the room. It could be a physiological reaction uh, together with a uh, with a belief system. But anyway, I come from a different angle. Um, for me, I, I started doing a series called White Noise, and you are all familiar with that. It's uh, if you have a TV screen and no channel. You see the dance of the electrons, or if you have a radio channel and nothing specific, you have shh, that is white noise. And interestingly, that is 2.7 Kelvin, which, which is still hanging in the universe as a residue re reminiscence of the Big Bang. So since the Big Bang, you know, the universe cooled down. But there's still enough radiation, 2.7 Kelvin, almost zero, which you can, which still manifest itself visually with all those dancing uh, electrons or acoustically. So we actually can still hear the very origin of of our of the existence of everything, and that's for me a very fascinating thought. Not only, only that, but also the fact that everything is energy. There's no matter. It just is an illusion because we have this density. And everything in space is just coagulated energy, if you want it. Waves. It's, everything is, is dancing. And we are not separate from each other, but just on different in, in so-called space, which doesn't exist for me, but we are just different uh, coagulations in space, and there is nothing which really separates us. Just have the illusion that I am I, and you are you. So that the nature of physics, <clears throat> of, of of the makeup of the universe, of our existence, of this dancing particles, waves, you know, it's always fluctuating, is the reason I do that. One reason. And uh, positions, 
make meaning, create meaning. It, it's mean, meaningful where what is in space. That makes the meaning. And the, the setting together of those particles create so-called things. So Braille, Braille is also, it's an ordered chaos of dots. So wherever things are, they create meaning. Braille, uh, why do I use Braille? Uh, this work, there's another one in the back. <clears throat> Braille is for me a metaphorical uh, uh, element in my work to, to say that we are the ones who are blind, who are turning blind. We can't read our world anymore or ourselves anymore very well. We seem to have lost the code, the key to meaning. And that's the reason, one of the reasons I use Braille in my work, but also I like the, the aesthetics of it. The, the order, uh, slight order, it's not so regular because each, each element is different, but somebody who, who comes, who sees that, thinks maybe, ah, oh, hmm, this could have a meaning, maybe. It's like watching at night the stars. And they say, oh, that's meaningful. I mean, so many meanings are put in, in the stars. Uh, astrology uh, did that. And it's a similar um, process because we are, we are maniacs. We always put meaning in things. We always try to, to, to make sense of everything. So, and it's a, it's, it's a trigger element, the brain. It triggers you to think, oh, what is that? And then, of course, uh, you will s find the text, what it means here, and then there's a Samuel Beckett text in the back, on, uh, which is bread. And then you have that, but you have the stimulus of the, of the element, of the, of the visual, which gives you a certain interpretation. And then you have something totally different and, and the tension between the text and the visual opens up a space, an extra space for interpretation. So you can actually even enlarge that way of interpreting things and looking at things. That's, I like that tension. That's with, with, with text, with braille, with the encrypted text as well. So, and <clears throat> my my last uh, monograph here, which if you are interested, unfortunately we have only this copy, they didn't send it yet from Melbourne, but you can order it. But it's interesting, there are good articles in it, and it's about surface and beneath. That's why I call this ex exhibition also Surface and Beneath. Because for me the surface is, of course, is, is, a, is an important uh, membrane, and be be beneath that it's uh, there is meaning, language, whatever. And the interesting thing is the, the marriage between surface and underlying meaning. Sometimes the, the, you know, the, the surface turns into meaning, or the meaning turns into surface. That, uh, that, 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 that balance of both, that's, that's really quite, in, quite important. And, and layers and layers and layers, of, of, which, which uh, configure then something unexpected sometimes, if you put them together. So, yeah, that's about the outline. Well, I mean, yes, in the back there is only a little anecdotic work, which is, has importance for myself more than probably. But it's also universal, uh, in a way. Uh, this braille work there. This is um, my my father. Um, that's that that one there. But some of you have seen it already. That one is is my father, and he turns now ninety, and he is not so well. And I I dedicated this work. That's my father on a bike, 1942. The Danube in Hungary during the war, he was 16. A friend of his with a bike went ahead to make this photo, and it's a very small photo. Uh, one of the few photos we took with us after 
our uh, we fled Hungary uh, after the revolution, you know, just a little black and white. So I found this back at my parents' place, and I made a photo of the photo, and then made a photo of the photo. Of the... So I, I, I created this uh, as a dedication of uh, of life uh, of my father, who is who is not here any long anymore, uh, probably. And it's called uh, from the series "When Do We Ever Meet Again?" And there's a beautiful poem, uh, Samuel Beckett, in Braille here, which you could read. Shall I read it? Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe yeah, I, I don't want to take that one. It's it's a it's about it's about life, which is gone goes by like that. You know, we just are here exactly. Thank you very much. And then we are gone, which is not a bad thing. But anyway, so it's called <clears throat> something there. Where? Out there. Out where? Outside. What? Outside the head. What else? Something there. Somewhere outside the head. My way is in the sand, flowing between the shingle and the dune. The summer rain rains on my life, on me, my life. Herring, fleeing, to its beginning, to its end. My peace is there in the receding mist, when I may cease from treading these long shifting thresholds and life, that space of a door that opens and shuts. What would I do without this world, faceless, incurious, where to be last? Where to be lasts but an instant where every instant spills in the void, the ignorance of having been, without this wave, where in the end body and shadow together are engulfed. What would I do without this silence where the murmurs die, the pantings, the frenzies towards soccer, towards love, without this sky that soars above its ballasts? dust. What would I do? What I did yesterday and the day before, peering out of my dead light looking for another, wandering like me, eddying far from all the living in a concursive space among the voices, voiceless, that throng my hiddenness. Yeah, that is uh, somehow a very deep thought Beckett put into this poem, and I thought it fits to, <laughs> to what I wanted to express. So it helps, it's an addition to that. Yes. Um, oh, well, that's, that's, that's quite obvious. I hope it's little bud, budding, buddings of a, of a tree which is standing in our garden every year. It, it comes, it appears, and it, it starts with red leaves, and in <coughs> autumn, green leaves. <laughs> so it's the it's a right reversal. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, what interested me here was the, you know, I mean, I forgot, of course, to say a very important aspect also of my work of the pixelations. We live in a digital world where zero and ones are dominating, so and, and pixelation, everything is pixelated. <laughs> you know, we are bombarded every day on our phones, everywhere with pixelated image. We don't even realize it anymore that they are pixelated. But it's all pixelated. And, and you know, it has, it, it has a, because as artists, I mean, <clears throat> not only artists, but we, if you are aware of, of, of visual and aesthetics, um, somehow the, the, the pixels could have a, 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 an aesthetics by themselves. So what, what kind of aesthetics is there in that? Which I try to exploit also, to research also in, in my work. It's a transposition sometimes of, of that pixelated, pixelatedness, so to say. And, and <laughs> I make sometimes this, uh, uh, experiments where I on the screen, you know, I magnify, 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 and then suddenly you can see almost the wiring of the computer. So you, you leave the, 
the software and then you go into the hardware. Software and, and hardware probably embrace each other and manifest themselves. You know, if you can see, that's all little, 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 like little of the wiring of, of, the, of the, uh, 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 the program of the computer. And it has an aesthetics itself. And of course, I manipulated that. I worked on still, you know, in, in, on, on the computer to, to get this. But I started out with, with, that, with that fascination of enlarging, enlarging, and deep down and diving into the, into the whole world of pixelation of, of, the, of the zero and ones. How long did it take you to do that? It, it oh, I, I don't remember exactly, but it, it was a quite a longish process. Exactly. It was a long process to, to get all these, these elements in, and yeah, it was quite, quite a long process. Uh, not unlike in the, my earlier time, uh, in the 80s, still mid-90s even, I was a, a very fast worker, you know. I mean, I, for me, it, the work was good when it was done in a brush stroke. <laughs> you know, it was like a, the zen, a zen stroke. And that was it. And now, an old donkey I am, now I do these long works and doing all these <laughs> painful, painstakingly, you know, works. But it's obviously, as you get older, you know, you do different things. Maybe I turn back at the end and do a brush stroke, you know, like the last, the last breath. <laughs> and then last brush stroke. And that's the best work. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, of course, please ask. I mean, I try to answer. But that was more or less the, the, the big frame of, of that. Any question? You, you may be speechless, I can. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I'd like to ask about the surface. How do you feel about this? Even seeing your hand running down the yeah. painting, and a lot of your stuff, you want to touch it. It's like sculptures, yeah. Yeah. but it's kind You're of that, it's like, a, yeah, see, <laughs> isn't it? But there's that thing of like, oh, even when I saw you do it, I was like, oh, it's not touching the surface, you're, but your stuff is... You're, you're allowed, you're allowed to, to gently stroke. Because it's hard not to. You can also stroke my back. Uh, <laughs> no, you're oh, good. that's <laughs> No, it's, course, it's a allowed, nice... It's, you're allowed. They're beautiful. Yeah, but yeah, you're just but all because it's tactile, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, it's, it's, you want to touch it. I think, yeah. yeah, there's an urge created by, by the visual as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah.